This video lecture will be discussing um, how we can alkylate the alpha position of carbonyl compounds. And to do this, we're going to use um, enolates as nucleophiles and uh, react them with primary or some secondary alkyl halides in an SN2 type substitution. Now, <clears throat> there are two main limitations to these types of reactions. Uh, the first one, obviously, is that since we're talking about an SN2 type substitution, tertiary alkyl halides cannot be used, and many secondary alkyl halides also can't be used. The second uh, limitation is that the enolate we have seen has two resonance forms. And so there's a negative charge uh, on both the oxygen and the carbon, and uh, that negative charge is, is shared between the two of them. And so there arises uh, potential complications in terms of, you know, um, the nucleophilic nature of the um, enolate ion. And so we can kind of take a look at that and say, well, okay, I, ha I know I have these two resonance structures, um, and I'm showing them here, right? Uh, the one on the top has the negative charge on the carbon, and the one on the bottom has the negative charge on the oxygen. <clears throat> and so if these were to behave as nucleophiles, um, we can look at the top one here. Um, if it reacts with an alkyl halide, to undergo an SN2 substitution, so um, attack at the carbon um, and displacement of the iodide, remember a concerted mechanism, and the product of this reaction is now I've added a methyl group to that alpha carbon. So I've extended the carbon chain. Um, and so if we, t if we think about uh, the um, enolate with the negative charge on the um, oxygen, and react that with uh, an alkyl halide, like methyl iodide. Now the oxygen is going to donate a pair of electrons, displacing the iodine, and you get um, methylation or alkylation at the oxygen. So these are the two possibilities. It happens that, um, based on molecular orbital calculations, the highest occupied molecular orbital has a greater electron density on the carbon of the enolate rather than the oxygen. So alkylation always takes place on the carbon itself. And, so, and, and in terms of predicting products then, um, we can simply say that, okay, the enolate has the negative charge on the carbon, um, it's going to react with alkyl halide, and I get um, alkylation at that particular carbon. So that's very important to, uh, to understand, okay? Okay, so let's take a look at um, alkylation of ketones and aldehyde enolates. Um, and when we start thinking about ketones themselves, um, we actually have another problem that arises. And that is that with alkylation of ketones, um, they have two possible alpha positions that can both produce enolates. Um, and so if you don't have a symmetrical ketone, um, you run into uh, quite a bit of a problem. And let's take a look uh, uh, at an example. Here we have uh, methylcyclohexanone. And methylcyclohexanone has two types of alpha carbons. Uh, the one on the right that I colored blue and the one on the left that I colored green, right? So um, when, when we go to deprotonate to form our enolate, uh, there are two possibilities that can happen. Uh, number one, we can get deprotonation of the um, alpha hydrogen on the right to form this particular enolate, right? Um, and then number two, we could get deprotonation of the one, one of the alpha hydrogens on the left, and I form this enolate. Right. So these are two different types of enolates, and of course both of these enolates um, can react with uh, an alkyl halide. Um, and on top of that, uh, we can get, you know, once um, alkylation occurs, we can form more enolates um, because there is an excess of, of base present. Uh, so if I, if I take a look at reacting um, 2-methyl cyclohexanone um, with sodium hydroxide to deprotonate, followed by methyl iodide. 
I, I certainly will get um, methylation on the left. I can also get methylation on the right, right? So you see that a methyl group has added to both the left and the right. And on top of that, I can even get further alkylation so that I can get a methyl group on the left and on the right. And of course, there's still one hydrogen left um, on the left-hand side, so I can get um, that trimethylation to occur. So I, I actually end up getting a mixture of products. Um, the yield for this particular reaction happens to be, you know, 9% of the, uh, that would be 2,5-dimethylcyclohexanone, 41% of the 2,2 the dimethylcyclohexanone, and then we have 21% of the trimethylcyclohexanone and only 6% of the tetramethylcyclohexanone. Now, the key here is that we're getting a mixture of products, and usually, you know, in organic chemistry, we don't like to see a mixture of products. We try to avoid this at all possible costs. So, how can we do this? Well, we can avoid this. Um, if we use a strong, pol uh, poorly nucleophilic base like LDA. Um, so LDA can form an the enolate. And, uh, and the interesting thing is that um, we can actually control the regioselectivity of that process. So that at low temperatures, um, LDA typically deprotonates the less hindered alpha carbon because of its bulkiness, right? And therefore, um, if I run this reaction now, um, taking 2-methylcyclohexanone, reacting it with LDA at minus 78 degrees, I'm going to form only one enolate, and that enolate is um, removing an alpha hydrogen on the left-hand side because it's less uh, sterically hindered. And now I can react that with uh, an alkyl halide in an SN2 type of, of substitution, and I get that... Um, that uh, five alkylated position and only the five alkylated position. And as a matter of fact, if I warm this reaction up, then um, I end up getting more and more of the 2,2 uh, di um, methyl, if I'm using a methyl halide in this case. Um, and that has to do with the stability of the uh, enolate. So as you warm up the uh, reaction at room temperature, um, the enolate on the right is more stable due to substitution of the, um, of the ene, alkene portion of the enolate. All right, so we see that we can control alkylation of uh, ketones and aldehydes if we simply treat them with um, LDA, a very strong base, to give us uh, uh, an enolate in high yield and then react that with an alkyl halide. We can also alkylate uh, carboxylic acid as well. And the little difference here is that we have to add two equivalents of LDA um, to the carboxylic acid. And in that process, a dianion is formed, right? So um, in the first step, what's going to happen, as in we should kind of figure out by now that we have a carboxylic acid, we're treating it with a strong base. So the first step is going to be deprotonation of the carboxylic acid. And we form our carboxylate. Now, once the carboxylate forms, another equivalent of LDA comes in and can remove an alpha hydrogen to form our enolate. Right, so now I have um, the enolate, and notice this is a dianion because I have an enolate carboxylate uh, mixture. And so now um, this dianion can either be, you know, we can alkylate it. We can also brominate it if if we want to. Right. So if I take this um, uh, dianion, the enolate carboxylate, react it with an alkyl halide, again SN2 type substitution. And I get now my alkylated, uh, I've alkylated the, the alpha hydrogen, uh, the alpha carbon of my carboxylic acid. Of course, it's a carboxylate still, so I can treat that with, um, with acid, and I protonate to get the carboxylic acid. And I can do this with um, uh, bromine as well. We've 
already talked about bromination, and this is another way uh, that we can uh, brominate a carboxylic acid at the alpha position. Uh, notice, you know, we, we still have kind of the same characteristics of carboxylic acids, forming the enolate, reacting with bromine in that substitution type pattern. Uh, so now I have a, a bromine in the alpha position, and then treating that with an acid to get my alpha brominated carboxylic acid. So I protonated the car carboxylate to get the carboxylic acid. So let's see a um, uh, an example of this, right? Here I have butanoic acid. I'm reacting it with uh, two equivalents of LDA. And then uh, I follow that up with reaction of an alkyl halide. In this case, I have propyl bromide. And then lastly, um, an aqueous acidic workup. And my product looks like this. So in the alpha position, I've added a propyl group to that alpha carbon. So this is an alpha how, um, uh, alkylation uh, of a carboxylic acid. Okay? All right. So now let's move on to alkylation of um, what are called beta dicarbonyl compounds. And we we saw initially in alkylation of ketones and aldehydes that um, generally speaking, you know, the acidity is such that um, if we want to form our enolate completely, we have to use a very strong base like LDA, strong, strong um, poorly nucleophilic base like LDA. Uh, and then we can alkylate. Beta dicarbonyl compounds are quite a bit different right, in that they are much more acidic than regular ketones and aldehydes, and we're going to even see esters, right. So um, just to give you a, an example to kind of refresh our memory, we've already looked at um, acetaldehyde, the pKa of acetaldehyde we know is 16.7. So a beta dicarbonyl compound has two carbonyl compounds, right? Um, and so if I look at the uh, acidity of the alpha hydrogens, at, at which if you think about now, I have two carbonyls withdrawing electron density, and therefore the acidity of those alpha hydrogens increases quite a bit. And as a matter of fact, if I look at the acidity of these two hydrogens, I see that the pKa is 5. Right? So we've gone down substantially uh, amount, so that um, this is almost as acidic as a carboxylic acid to put it in perspective, right, carboxylic acids have pKa's around four and a half or so. And um, this is with an aldehyde. I can do this with a, um, a beta um, diketone. So we have a beta dialdehyde. This is a beta diketone. And by beta diketones, again, we're talking about the, um, the alpha hydrogens in the middle. Obviously, you know, the, with a beta ketone, I ha also have alpha hydrogens on the outside, and, and their pKa's um, are, in, again, in the high teens, but the um, one, ones in the middle have a much higher pKa, and we see their pKa is about 9. Um, and, of course, I can even look at uh, esters, beta diesters, um, and a Again, we're talking about the um, the hydrogens in that middle there, and with esters, we you know we we see the trend of um, acidity decreasing as you add um, R groups. So um, aldehydes are more acidic than ketones. Ketones are more acidic than um, esters, right? And and this again follows that same trend, such that the uh, pK of these uh, alpha hydrogens of esters isn't quite as great, but it still is substantially um, more acidic than the pK of esters, which are typically around 25, right? Or 24, I should say. So ketones have pKa's in the um, really high teens, 19, 20. Um, now, and we see that uh, with uh, beta diketones, a lot lower. Esters typically have a pKa of uh, 24. And again, here we have a situation where um, the pKa is a lot lower. Now, what does that mean to us? Well, um, they are acidic enough such that they can be deprotonated, deprotonated by alkoxides. 
remember alkoxides, the um, conjugate acid of alkoxides uh, are alcohols, and alcohols have a pKa of about 16 to 17. And so um, if I treat a beta dicarbonyl compound with a, an alkoxide, the equilibrium is going to be favored toward the weaker acid, which would be the alcohol. And so we can form a lot of enolate this way. So here I have an example of a, uh, a beta keto ester. It's a little bit of a mix. I have an ester on one side, a ketone on the other side, and we call these beta keto esters. And I can react it with um, RO minus, the alkoxide of the um, ester portion. So notice um, the, the alkoxide that we would use is going to be the same as whatever our group is on the ester portion. And the reason for this is because we know that um, esters can undergo transesterification as well. So if we use the same R group that is already on the ester, Transesterification may take place, but we're not. Go we're going to get the same product, so that's important to understand. And you'll you're going to see this from you know uh, as kind of we go throughout uh, the chapter. Uh, typically, the uh, esters we use are going to be methyl esters or ethyl esters, so that we can use methoxide and ethoxide in the process. So. Um, the alkoxide removes a proton one of the, from one of the, uh, uh, or from the alpha carbon in the middle, and I generate my enolate here. And so now I can take that enolate, react it with um, an alkyl halide, and undergo a substitution reaction. Now, uh, notice in this particular example, um, I still have uh, uh, an alpha hydrogen on there. And so I could take that alkylated product react it with another equivalent of alkoxide to remove that last, that second proton and form my enolate again and react that enolate with a different alkyl halide such that I'm getting a dialkylation. So I could add two different R groups in this, in that process. And we're going to see how we can take that and we could actually um, hydrolyze that ester um, and then decarboxylate the resulting carboxylic acid. And we'll look at that a little bit later on. Okay, so uh, let's look at a, a couple of examples here. This is a beta diketone. I'm reacting it with a, um, a, a base, so a strong base in this case. Um, notice I'm using sodium hydride. Uh, I'm not using an alkoxide here because uh, the ketones uh, don't have uh, um, uh, leaving groups, good leaving groups to, to come off, so I don't really have to worry about that. Um, so I'm simply using sodium hydride and then forming my um, enolate, then reacting that enolate with uh, benzyl bromide, and it adds to that alpha position. I, I get that benzyl group adding to the alpha position. And we'll take a look, and look at another example, a, a beta diester. <coughs> so notice this is a methyl, a dimethyl uh, diester of malonic uh, acid. So this is a dimethyl malonic um, ester. I react it with sodium methoxide. Why methoxide? Because I have uh, uh, methyl, key, methyl esters um, on my ester, right? So if transesterification does occur, then I get the same product. Um, and then we form my enolate. The enolate reacts with sodium iodide. I can then go back, react it with another equivalent of sodium methoxide, and then treat it with ethyl iodide. And so now I'm getting this dialkylation. I end up with a methyl group on that alpha carbon and then an ethyl group on the carbon. And the product looks like this, right? So that's how um, alkylation of, of uh, beta dicarbonyls looks. Now, I said that we can do things with them, uh, and we certainly can, and that process is called hydrolysis and decarboxylation. So these beta dicarbonyls, if there is um, an ester portion to them, uh, then they can undergo um, uh, hydrolysis and decarboxylation. So the key is that when a beta keto ester, uh, such as ethyl acetoacetate, is hydrolyzed, a beta keto acid is formed. And we know 
based on previous knowledge that beta keto acids can undergo decarboxylation. So we're going to get hydrolysis followed by decarboxylation. And uh, ethyl, so here is an example of, um, this is ethyl acetoacetate, right? Ethyl acetoacetate. We'll learn how to actually make these um, beta keto esters uh, in, in a little bit. Um, but if I take ethyl acetoacetate, we think about this for a second, and I hydrolyze it, right? So uh, reaction that we've learned before, esters undergo hydrolysis in acidic or basic conditions. Uh, but in acidic conditions, we get the carboxylic acid. So now I have a beta keto acid. And now I can take that beta keto acid, and I heat it up, and I make acetone. Right? and carbon dioxide that comes off of it. So the, the key is that um, uh, we can take a beta keto ester and we, we can make um, a ketone from that, right? Now, if we think about the combination of alkylation of beta keto um, esters or acids followed by hydrolysis, uh, and decarboxylation, this is a great way of making fairly complex ketones, right? So we can make ketones this way. So here's an example. I have a, a beta keto ester uh, reacting it with uh, NaOr, right? So kind of a generic way of, of thinking about it. Um, uh, it's going to form the enolate. Now that enolate can react with an alkyl halide, Rx, and I can, uh, so I alkylate that alpha position, right? Now, what can I do with that? Well, I can hydrolyze it. So I take the ester and I can convert it to a carboxylic acid. So now I have a beta keto carboxylic acid. And I can take that beta keto carboxylic acid and I can heat it up and I get a ketone. So now notice I've added that R group onto the ketone and of course carbon dioxide comes off of it. Now we also saw that in this particular example there's uh, there are two, if we go all the way back to our beta keto ester on the left there, there are two hydrogens on there. So I have alkylated one position but I can take that product, treat it with another um, equivalent of sodium alkoxide followed by another um, alkyl halide and I can dialkylate it. And so now I could take that dialkylated product, hydrolyze it to make my carboxylic acid, and then heat that up to make my ketone. All right, so uh, the key is that um, a beta keto ester we start with makes a ketone. A beta keto ester makes a ketone. So let's look at an example of this. Here we have um, uh, ethyl acetoacetate. I'm treating it with sodium ethoxide, right, because I have an ethyl ester, um, and then followed by a reacting it with one iodobutane. So now I'm going to butylate the um, ethyl acetoacetate. So there's my my butylated product, and um, if I wanted to, I could do another alkylation. So I could um, react it with another equivalent of sodium ethoxide, followed by reacting with methyl bromide. So now I'm going to methylate that alpha carbon, and so my product looks like this. I've methylated and butylated it, and now at this stage, I can hydrolyze. Um, to form my carboxylic acid and then heat that carboxylic acid, that uh, beta keto carboxylic acid up, and I end up with a ketone. And notice uh, that ketone has on the alpha carbon a butyl group coming off and a methyl group coming off. Now, these types of reactions are called beta keto ester synthesis. And that's a little bit confusing because it almost sounds like you're synthesizing beta keto, keto esters, but you're, you're not. You're taking a beta keto ester and you're actually forming ketones from the beta keto esters. So a beta keto ester synthesis is a way to synthesize ketones from beta keto esters.
And I can actually take um, and re react to malonic esters, um, which is called malonic ester synthesis, to make carboxylic acids. So let's uh, look at an example uh, of a malonic uh, ester synthesis. So uh, this is a, a generic structure of malonic ester. It comes from malonic acid, um, where the two, instead of having two OR groups, you'd have two OH groups. That's malonic uh, acid. This is called a malonic ester. And if I take uh, this malonic ester and again treat it with um, sodium OR, an alkoxide, um, followed by uh, an alkyl halide, SN2 substitution, uh, on that alpha carbon. So I get an alkylation on that alpha carbon, followed by um, acidification um, or hydrolysis to give me now a, um, this is a 1,3 dicarboxylic acid, right? And again, we know that 1,3 dicarboxylic acids, and I'm going to simply redraw it down here, 1,3 dicarboxylic acids, when you add heat to them, undergo decarboxylation. And you end up with um, one of the carboxylic acids remaining behind, right? Um, and so I end up making a carboxylic acid where the R group I've added to it. And, and again, uh, uh, another way of making... Um, fairly complex carboxylic acids. Now, if we think about the retrosynthetic analysis of this process, it can be quite challenging for these types of reactions. And so the key is that you have to be able to identify the R groups that can be attached through um, alkylation, okay? So let's look at an example and, and um, let me show you what I mean by this. Here I have um, the, this particular ketone, okay? So how do I make that ketone? Well, I can make it from ethyl acetoacetate. And when I think about the retrosynthesis of this, the question is what R groups do I need to add to ethyl acetoacetate? And you also need to recognize what I call the base of, of this um, ethyl acetoacetate. And that base is right here. So I'm adding, remember, to that carbon, that alpha carbon. Um, and and that is, that's the important aspect that we have to think about. So... Um, Looking at my, my, the structure of my product, this is the base, and so that's the base, and so I have a methyl and an ethyl group as my R groups, right? So now I know that my R groups that I'm going to have to add as alkyl halides are methyl halide and ethyl halide. So if I take ethyl acetoacetate, Again, I'm going to react it with a base of sodium ethoxide because I'm using ethyl acetoacetate. And then I treat that with methyl iodide or ethyl iodide, doesn't matter what the order is. I could use methyl iodide, then another equivalent of sodium ethoxide, followed by the second alkyl halide, in this case ethyl iodide, but again, the order really doesn't matter. I get dialkylation of my ester, followed by hydrolysis and heat decarboxylation, and I end up with my ketone. And that's basically how uh, you, you know, you work on the retrosynthetic analysis of that. All right, so let's take a look at um, how to design a synthesis of a, a carboxylic acid. So again, we can start with the malonic ester as our um, as our starting point, when you have a carboxylic acid, when you're trying to make a carboxylic acid, you're going to start with a malonic, es um, a malonic ester, right? And again, you know, this is kind of our base where we're going to start with. So if we, if we think about um, the, the connection between our malonic ester and our carboxylic acid, we can see, uh, you know, where that base is coming from. Um, and so what have we added there? Well, we have added as an R group 
a, a ring with a, a methylene group, and this is a, a benzyl group. So we are going to treat the malonic ester with benzyl halide, benzyl bromide, benzyl iodide, benzyl chloride, doesn't really uh, matter in this case, right? So in terms of the synthesis, I'm going to take my meth my ethyl uh, mal uh, malonate, ethyl malonate, diethyl malonate, react that with sodium ethoxide uh, in ethanol, followed by reaction with uh, my alkyl halide, in this case benzyl bromide or benzyl iodide, right, doesn't really matter, and I get alkylation. So now I have my alkylated diethyl malonate, and then I can hydrolyze that to make the 1,3-dicarboxylic acid, and then decarboxylate that, and I end up with the carboxylic acid that I'm trying to make. So that's kind of the key um, in terms of retrosynthetic analysis of these um, beta keto uh, esters or uh, uh, or malonic uh, et malonic ester syntheses. All right, now let's take a look at you know we we looked at alkylation of um, aldehydes and ketones, um, and so we're going to take a look at alkylation of esters as well. And we saw that uh, esters don't form enolates as readily as aldehydes and ketones, and so we typically, again, we're going to use LDA uh, to ensure enolate formation. And um, this isn't often done, but it certainly can be done. So if I take a, a here I have methyl butanoate and I'm reacting it with LDA to form my um, enolate of my ester, and then react that with ethyl bromide, I can now ethylate or, uh, that alpha carbon and I get my product, right? So very similar to um, aldehydes and ketones. Keep in mind, I mean, the easiest way to alkylate an aldehyde, a ketone, or an ester is to treat it with LDA, followed by uh, whatever primary alkyl halide you want, and you can get um, alkylation in good yields. Now, we can also alkylate ene amines. Um, and uh, through this process, this is simply another way of alkylating an alpha carbon of a ketone, right? Remember, ene amines are formed from, from the reaction of a ketone or an aldehyde um, with a secondary amine, and you make ene amines. And these ene amines undergo the same types of reactions as enolates. Be why? Because they have an alkene present, right? Um, and so again, seeing the, um, the continuity, the similarity between functional groups is very important. So let's take a look at, at a typical example. Here we have uh, a, a ketone, we have some R group coming off. Um, and, you know, for our purposes, we have to assume that that R group doesn't have any uh, alpha hydrogens present, so that's certainly a key. Um, and we're going to react this with pyrrolidine, right? So this is a, a typical way of, of, um, of uh, alkylating uh, through an enamine. Uh, the amine that you use, the, the secondary amine, remember we have to use a secondary amine, um, is pyrrolidine. It forms uh, enamines fairly readily. So when I react a ketone with pyrrolidine, I get this as my product. So this is the enamine, remember? Um, and, and now if I react that enamine with an alkyl halide in an SN2 type mechanism, the pair of electrons from nitrogen are going to go down to form a, a, a pi bond, and the alkene pi bond is what reacts with the, the alkyl halide. So we're, we're adding that R group ag again to the alpha position, and we form what's called an iminium ion, an iminium ion. And so now, um, I know that, you know, we've seen that uh, Amines and iminium ions can um, hydrolyze fa fairly readily, so um, I can treat this with water and undergo hydrolysis to get back the ketone. 
And it, again, in the process, I have alkylated that alpha position. So as an example, I can take um, cyclohexanone, react it with uh, pyrrolidine, and get my uh, enamine uh, um, compound. And so now I can take that enamine and I can react it with uh, propyl iodide followed by that uh, aqueous um, acidic hydrolysis process uh, and I have added a propyl group to the alpha carbon of my ketone. Now, um, you know, there are some limitations to this type of reaction, obviously, in that it works only with um, symmetrical ketones or ketones that only have one type um, of alpha hydrogen. And the reason for that is if it had two types of alpha hydrogens, you would form a mixture of products. So that wraps up how we alkylate um, various types of carbonyl compounds.